stage. Uh, my name is uh, Amanda Haynes, and I'm representing Own Depot today, along with my colleague Martin Power here as well, who will um, chime in at a later point in the, our presentation. <coughs> so, notorious black spot war zone. Uh, these were the kinds of adjectives that were used to characterise my Ross and that drew us to study its media depiction. So what we want to do in this paper today is to summarise for you the results of our research. In addition to mapping out media coverage of Moy Ross, we also explored the forces that shape the form that that coverage takes. And we've also examined uh, impact on local residents. As sociologists, our interest in this research theme stems both from a specific concern with the reputation of Moy Ross and also, and you can see the parallels in terms of um, the Dutch case in terms of Glasgow as well, um, to, to learn from the case of my Ross regarding discourses that stigmatise places and people, and whether and how these can be resisted and challenged. So we want to begin our paper today then by, first of all, just explaining to you the, the theoretical context that we come from. Um, and it's very much in line with what you would have been hearing from Matt and also from uh, Annette earlier. Um, we want to present to you our methodology. Um, we want to detail for you the sources of the content that we analysed, as well as explaining how we investigated the context within which this content was produced and its impacts. We're going to present our findings regarding media representation of the estate and we're going to present the range of explanations for the shape that media coverage takes that was offered to us by media professionals. We're also going to present the views of Moy Ross residents and activists concerning how the media coverage of the area impacts on people living there. And finally, we're going to finish up by addressing the question of whether and how a stigmatised neighbourhood identity might be rehabilitated. Okay. So our concern with stigmatised neighbourhood identity is informed by the work, as I said, of, of researchers like Matt and also Annette, also people like Frank Bassenberg and Glenn Gourley, who focus on the image of an estate as the imp an important aspect of its lived reality. And this body of work demonstrates that negative stereotypes which damage the reputation of places in which the poor reside have very real consequences for the people who live there. We're very much influenced by Annette's assertion that discourses about the places in which the poor and excluded live can be classified as either normalising or pathologising. Normalising discourses explain the state's problems in terms of structural causes and reject the idea that the behaviour of residents as a group differentiates them from the residents of other estates. In contrast, then, pathologising discourses focus on behavioural explanations for estates' problems. They regard residents as possessing deviant norms and values which represent a threat to mainstream culture and might be transmitted to and reproduced by their children. Such discourses construct estates as problem places for problem people. Now, we've noted today that pathologising discourses impact upon outsiders' understandings of an area and also we've seen from the work of both Matt and Annette that they can have profound impacts on people's uh, life chances, their experiences, and also their self-image. We've seen this in relation to, we've had mention of um, the lack of access to employment opportunities, to service provision, for example, in relation to a next work. Um, but also, for example, relationships between poor reputation and low levels of social participation. <coughs> and at the end of the day, uh, impacts in terms of what is often referred to as the address effect, where people may choose, uh, as a result of negative reputations, to mask where it is that they come from, or alternatively related to Matt's work, that they may choose to leave, that they may choose to exit. For us, that, this is the context that makes this kind of study worthwhile, that justifies it. Now, I want to lay out for you then our, our methodological approach. And what we used in this study was what is referred to as a tripartite approach, which incorporates content, production, and reception. So specifically then, we undertook a qualitative content analysis of print media and broadcast texts. We also interviewed media professionals, and we conducted focus groups with residents from and community activists in Moy Ross itself. 
So this methodology was chosen to facilitate a holistic approach to the research topic. It allows us to document the discursive content of media coverage, to generate insights into the dynamics that shape that content at the point of production, and to explore its reception by local audiences. Print media content was sampled from four newspapers, uh, The Independent, The Leader, The Irish Mirror and The Irish News, and we chose these for their diversity of audiences and styles. The time period that we chose was between the 1st of January 2006 and the, the 31st of December 2007. And we specifically selected this time frame in order to include within our sample the extensive media coverage um, of a specific case, the, the arson attack on Gavin and Millie Murray. And also to include within our sample media coverage of rege the Regeneration Project, which was subsequently announced. In total, we analysed uh, 420 print articles. Uh, in terms of the te television broadcast then, we selected those from RT's 6-1 News and also from the 9 o'clock news programmes. And those were chosen for the period between September the 1st, 2006 to the end of that year. And we also analysed in terms of um, uh, radio coverage uh, a documentary which was based upon a composite of radio broadcasts concerning Gavin and Millie Murray, which was made by a local radio station. <coughs> So this was chosen as a particular case study that we incorporated into the research also. We conducted two focus groups with residents in Moiras following a preliminary analysis of the print and broadcast media content. And uh, in each group, one community activist also participated. We also conducted semi-structured interviews with five media professionals who work in the print and broadcast sectors and who have reported on Moiras. So that gives you a sense of where the findings that we're going to talk about now emerge from. Okay, um, so Martin is going to, to take you through uh, our summary of our analysis now in relation first of all to the media content itself uh, and then to the perspectives of the media professionals who spoke to us and to the perspectives of residents, if our projection holds up. Um, and then I'm going to, to come back in at the end to, to give you a brief update and to talk to you a little bit about what we think the implications of our findings are. Uh, I'm going to stay sitting because I'm lazy. Um, okay, uh, so before, um, before I talk about the, the journalist's viewpoints <coughs> on how they report about my Ross, um, I suppose I'll just summarise really the, the main findings from the analysis of the, the media coverage from that particular period. Um, and again, I suppose it, it, it's hardly surprising that it was predominantly negative. Um, but I suppose how negative it is is, is, is surprising. Um, only just over 4% of the newspaper articles, for example, focus on any form of positive community initiatives um, as their primary theme. Um, again, the, the, the coverage was much more likely to be episodic rather than thematic in orientation, uh, and the language that was used um, was, was very sensationalist often, often and it, it, it was the language that actually reinforces the stigmatised identity. Uh, of this particular neighbourhood. Um, and again, we, we found um, constant reference to the routine use of particular descriptors, one of which was uh, troubled. And uh, troubled appeared in 38 of the uh, newspaper articles that we looked at. Uh, but I suppose what was most notable about that particular phrase was that the phrase was used by journalists and sub editors uh, rather than the sources that they quote in the article. So, so the, the phrase troubled or troubled the state is a very powerful um, media construct. Um, aside from sort of geographical um, qualifiers like the state or, or Limerick's Moiros, uh, the most common descriptor to describe the place was notorious. Uh, there was also a small number of references to the estate being a, a black spot, a site of endemic problems or being a time bomb. Um, and a number of the articles also actually uh, employed the metaphor of uh, Myros being a war zone. Um, the positive descriptors were in a tiny minority from the sample that we had. Uh, they effectively consisted of three references to Myros as, as a community. Um, again, in, in, in terms of the sample of television news stories that Amanda uh, mentioned there, uh, we found that the convention of, of constructing my Ross as being a troubled estate um, extended beyond the reporting styles of individual journalists. 
um, and that the epithet was used by uh, newscasters, for example, in introducing reports about my Ross. And the, the, again, the trouble of the state was even used as a descriptor within uh, RTE's um, news archive itself. Um, and you can see uh, that practice in, in some of these clips here, hopefully, if I can... Um, if you, um, you're not going to hear the, the no speakers? Okay. Um, you just have to take my word for it, that there's the constant use of um, troubled uh, throughout um, this, these particular um, images. Uh, also, it's the, the, the routine use of particular types of images... Uh, you know, boarded up houses, uh, wandering ho horses, etc., uh, etc. Et um, so, uh, again, apologies if the audio doesn't work, but um, I can give it to anybody if they want it. Um, okay, so, um, in, in contrast, for example, to, to the, the, the clips I've just shown you and what, what's actually in that, you know, the constant reference to the troubled estate of my Ross, uh, you know, there, there were examples. So, for example, um, RTE's prime time on the 26th of September in 2006 managed to talk about the complexities of the many issues in relation to the estate and what was facing the residents at that particular time um, from contrasting ideological positions without once actually using that phrase of the troubled estate. Uh, so it can be done um, when they want to. Um, the, the, in terms of the, the actual uh, articles, um, again, the, the national print media tended to be more, in, in terms of the sample that we looked at, the national print media tended to be more sensationalist than the, the local counterparts um, and they were less likely to carry uh, positive community uh, uh, stories about positive community events um, but while the national media um, included fewer positive stories than the local media, uh, even in the local media the majority of local content was still negative uh, and, and again, I suppose what we saw was that even positive stories often incorporated reference to the estate's uh, stigmatised image. Uh, if you look at you know, the content of the actual uh, uh, um, sample that we had, uh, 22 out of 24 television news reports about the estate during this time um, had crime as their primary theme, as did 70% of the newspaper articles. Um, so of 420 newspaper articles, 70% of them were about crime. Um, yes, the period that we looked at did incorporate the Millie and Gavin um, arson attack, um, but even when you take those articles out of the equation, uh, crime is by still uh, far and away the biggest category of stories. Uh, it represents 52% of the Limerick leaders' coverage, 77% uh, of the Irish Independence coverage, 88% of the Irish Mirror, and 90% of the Irish News article. Uh, the following then are just some examples of the stories and headlines. Uh, so the first one is All Out War, uh, My Ross Reels from New Horror, um, Tensions Rise After my, after Murder in My Ross. I particularly like the first one there. Uh, the first sentence says, Tensions were visibly high, but I, I, I've never seen a, a tension. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, and then the last one, um, people are now saying that even babies in their buggies aren't safe. So these, these are just uh, some of the headlines um, and articles from that particular sample. Um, okay. Um, so, so I now want to talk about the, the media practices um, which actually produce and reproduce the stigmatised identity. Um, and a number of the journalists that we actually talked to had themselves used that phrase, the, the trouble the state, in their coverage of the, the, the area. Uh, and when we put that practice, you know, the use of that, that term to them, they, they did acknowledge that the term itself was problematic. Um, but they were nonetheless unapologetic about its, about its use, as the, this quote um, actually shows. Um, so again, you know, that, that, uh, I, I have called it a trouble to state depending on the story. It is problematic. Of course it is that it suffers from a label, those types of labels. I suppose trouble to state is what it is at times, so that's why the phrase is used. Uh, but the residents are also acute, uh, acutely aware, really, of that type of uh, labelling. Uh, and again, you can see that from uh, this particular quote um, from one of our residents' participants. Um, although the, the journalists that we did speak to were, they, they did seem quite attuned to the negative aspects of uh, life in my Ross, uh, much more so than the sort of everyday banality of most residents' lives, um, they did um, acknowledge and recognise that the focus of media attention <coughs> was almost overwhelmingly on the uh, negative rather than on a, a balanced depiction of the area. Um, though they did qualify that somewhat by saying that that's the case everywhere that, 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 and, and someone mentioned it this morning as well 
Um, again, the, 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 the term Myros um, sort of acts like a, a cognitive trigger almost for, for us as, as media audience members. And it provides you really then with a sort of a familiar storyline about the area and about its residents, uh, which serve really to reinforce uh, what are largely commonly held beliefs about the people and the place. Uh, and again, both the, the community <coughs> participants that, we, that, that, that took part in our study uh, and the journalists who took part uh, sort of recognised that uh, template. Um, so again, this is from, from one of the journalists. Um, I think there has been in the past some truth to caricatures, there often is, but I think the caricature has suited the media. And when a particular image is in the public mind and it will sell newspapers or alternatively it will bring in viewers or listeners, they have a tendency to feed into that stereotype. Um, okay, so, so one of the things that we um, found was really that, that, that changing work practices uh, in journalism, how journalism is undertaken, have had a significant uh, impact really on, on um, how stories are constructed. Um, again, in, in the case of Myros, um, while the bigger stories will attract journalists to the locality, uh, many of the stories about the place are now researched remotely, um, by phone or by e email even, uh, and that applies to journalists working for the national and the local um, media organisations. Um, some of the journalists, the, the residents in particular, were very critical of the way in which the journalists used a very limited range of sources. And I suppose the dangers of using a limited range of sources is the increasingly um, the, 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 the increased uh, concentration or reliance on particular types of sources uh, and, and the reliance on sources rather than, than first hand observation. Uh, the reliance on official sources who are more uh, readily uh, available and, and identifiable, uh, and on, uh, on a smaller number of sources also. Uh, and in the context of, of, of those types of practices, it's much more difficult to develop uh, an alternative maybe to the dominant interpretation of events in, in any particular area. Um, changes in work practices have also uh, resulted in a greater reliance on uh, archive images of the estate. And again, you would have seen some of those uh, earlier on in that clip, which had no audio. Um, our analysis of the television content in particular identified the repeated use of a very limited range of depictions of Myros, uh, including burnt out houses, many of which didn't actually exist at the time that the footage was shown because they'd been demolished, uh, and, and the obligatory wandering horses uh, and, and youths in hoodies. Um, so again, you know, this is what we constantly saw, the, the use of, of library and archival footage. Uh, again, all the, the newspaper journalists that, that we talked to emphasised the degree to which the final shape of the story was actually impacted upon by the role of the editor or the sub-editor. Uh, and again, they, they admitted that this process is actually sometimes problematic for them as individual reporters uh, because sometimes their stories are reordered uh, to give us a, a, more, um, a significantly more sensationalist slant to the story. Uh, and again, one of our interviewees spoke about the way in which the copy that they had provided was reordered in order to place the gorier elements of the story towards the top, uh, it, it, you know, because uh, this was, was deemed to be more uh, newsworthy. So the, the, the concept of newsworthiness, um, as we went along, came to really occupy a pivotal sort of uh, role in terms of understanding the practice of, of journalism. Um, <laughs> The estate's newsworthiness is defined uh, primarily in terms of crime. Uh, and our journalist interviewees explained that, that really um, the expectations of their uh, editors um, and changing audience, audience taste sort of required um, that this is what Myros was newsworthy for. Uh, and repeatedly we were told that stories about criminality uh, were much more likely to be accepted uh, by editors and sub-editors than positive stories about the place. Um, again, they, they acknowledge the newsworthiness of neg negative stories, and there's a general agreement, really, that um, bad news stories are much more likely to be published, but also to re receive uh, prominent coverage. Um, and again, that they, this quote um, from a journalist um, that took part uh, sort of shows that. Um, in the analysis of the, the media content, we found that many of the good news stories about Myros uh, which were unrelated to criminality or antisocial behaviour or anything like that, still made reference to those issues. Um, so it, 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 it served, that, that process serves to dilute the positivity of the overall report. Um, again, one of our journalists um, who took part made specific reference to the underlying news value uh, 
in order to explain that phenomenon. So it was the actual juxtaposition between the stigmatized image of the area and the positive estate or the positive I uh, event that actually made the, um, the story newsworthy. In terms of how this impacts on, on residents, um, our community uh, participants were all very uh, acutely aware of the media image of their estate. They made a direct connection between the source of the representation and public perceptions of the uh, area. And while many um, vocally resisted that stigmatizing construction of the estate, they were also um, re relating um, the ongoing impact of the emotion on their emotional and material well-being from this uh, stigmatized uh, identity. Um, okay, so they, so they again, as Matthew mentioned this morning, um, they cited uh, a number of impacts on their uh, of, of this stigmatized identity on their interactions with. Uh, external actors. So again, taxis was one of the main things. Um, and it, they, they, they cited a number of services, really, in relation to which they perceived that they'd be denied equal access, including taxis, but also things like insurance cover and costs uh, and mortgages, as this particular quote um, from, a, from one of the community participants uh, shows here. Uh, and again, as, as Matthew mentioned, the, the stigmatized identity of, of Myros contributes to the, the resident's sense of uh, exclusion. Um, and again, this, this quote here um, from one of the community participants said, I, I know there's a lot of people who won't go into my Ross because they're probably nervous. But again, she said, but that's all down to the papers. Like. So if you, if you keep with that argument um, you know, advanced by the residents, you know, the, uh, what's, what's of additional importance really is the way or the manner in which that stigmatized image of the estate is, is received by those people outside of the estate who have no dealings with the estate and how that stigmatized image influences how people interact um, with, with people from Myros or, or perceive people from my, Myros to be. Um, and I suppose just uh, uh, sort of to show you how that process can work, um, in 2010, uh, Google Street View mapped uh, over 50,000 kilometers of roads, lanes uh, uh, throughout uh, Ireland. Um, two areas of Limerick, um, in particular Myros and St. Mary's Park, uh, weren't mapped, they were omitted. Uh, in fact, the only image of my Ross at that particular time that appeared on Google Street View was this one, which was taken from the relative safety of the other side of a wall in Cardiff. Um So again, you know, the, the, the local politicians, um, Google said it was for uh, operational reasons. Um, the, the former mayor, John Gilligan, said that it was given the impression that estates like my Ross were a no-go area. Uh, that Google was doing this out of prejudice based on reports they have of the area that it was entirely irresponsible of them. And if, if as is claimed by some of those uh, local councillors at that particular time, that, that multinational companies like Google were being influenced by reports they have of the area, so much so that they didn't feel it was, uh, you know, that, that there was a need to send a car in there to take photographs of the internal structure of the estate, well then this uncritical reproduction of a, a stigmatised identity that, that's been attached to my Ross in the media has very uh, serious implications for the immediate and the long-term future of the estate. Uh, now, they have addressed this in the intervening period. Um, so this, this photograph, for example, no longer exists. You can't see this anymore. And they have now matched the internal structure. But again, the images that it projects, are, they're no longer there. So if you go down, if you look at, if you, if you look at Delmage Park in Google Street View, most of the houses that you see that are there no longer exist. Um, so again, you know, it, it's still giving an image of a place that doesn't actually exist. So I'll, I'll hand you back to Amanda again now. Okay. Um, just before we go on to, to talk about the implications of the research findings, I just want to give you a little update, or uh, somewhat of a peripheral update, in that it's not an update to our work on my Ross, but to say that we've recently begun um, a similar process of mapping media coverage in relation to South Hill and Balnacar Weston. And we've just begun the process of analysing a, uh, a sample of uh, print media <coughs> articles, again, drawn from four newspapers, in this case, between the 1st of January 2009 and the um, end of December 2011. And just a cursory analysis of the, the articles that we've drawn down so far, 509 articles, uh, indicates that of those, 61% are about crime. Um, on a related point, then, uh, in the last two weeks, we've seen uh, a number of councillors call on RTE to return to Limerick to balance past coverage with coverage of po positive aspects of the city, the community, and the work of the voluntary sector here. 
Um, however, Councillor Gerfahi was quoted in the Limerick Post as saying, I told them I had the names of many people who have been involved in doing very positive and productive work for the city, but there was no interest from RTE in those people. They only wanted negative stories of criminality, antisocial activity and worse. Now, we have emphasised that there are structural factors that place obstacles in the path of media professionals who are seeking to challenge stigmatised identities. But our research does also identify that there are possibilities for change from within. Uh, overall, for example, we found that the broadcast media tend to offer greater potential for agency on the part of journalists. For example, the immediacy of television news broadcasts seems to provide journalists with greater control over the finished product, which is aired to the viewing public. As such, the medium in which the story is told uh, does impact on the amount of agency available to the journalist in the moment to tell another story. Nonetheless, it is important to acknowledge that although the broadcast journalist might have greater autonomy in that moment, news values, commercial concerns, resource issues, and final accountability to editorial staff and their news values provides an overarching context that constrains the choices that can be made about what stories to tell and how to tell them. It is important to note, though, that it's not inevitable that the media use stigmatising epithets in relation to Moiras. In stark contrast to the pathologising discourses evident within much of the media coverage, the local radio station's documentary, which narrates the story of the arson attack on Million Gavin and its aftermath, does so in a sensitive way. In this case, normalising discourses are to the fore. Um, we see Moy Ross in this case portrayed as being no different to the rest of the nation. We see that it emerges as a place united in its anger and grief. There's no references at all in this media coverage to trouble the state. The documentary is exemplary in that it seeks to balance the viewpoints of those most affected by this horrific attack with the perspectives of community and national <coughs> leaders. Crucially, it narrates a catastrophic story without ever once pathologising Moy Ross or its residents. It's noteworthy that this most consistently balanced coverage emanated from a media organisation which made a conscious decision to eschew uh, the repetition of stereotypes about Moy Ross. So it made a conscious decision to move away from that. Media professionals operating to tight deadlines and in an increasingly insecure occupational environment don't get many opportunities for critical self-reflection. In an environment in which it's um, like this, it's all the more <coughs> difficult to recognise or to alter practices and routines. We do hope that research like this can help to bridge that gap, but we note also that significant change requires leadership from media organisations. We simply can't uh, place responsibility solely on individual uh, journalists. The residents to whom we spoke expressed a sense of frustration and in some cases a sense of powerlessness in the face of their construction in the media. And certainly, in line with what Matthew said, there is reason to be dismayed by the obstacles to altering the reputation of disadvantaged estates. But it's also the case, as we'll see when, when Brian <coughs> talks, that and um, there is evidence that with sufficient resources, it is possible to influence media content and to engage in impression management. Communities in St. Michael's and Fatima Mansions have developed media strategies in this regard. Um, and Brian, for example, in talking about Fatima, will, will evidence the, a turnaround, really, in terms of Fatima's media representation as a result of capacity building, which empowered residents to engage in agenda setting and to assert themselves in negotiating terms uh, with media producers. In other national contexts, in other places, communities have also done things like um, set up public events to <coughs> challenge media misrepresentations where they occur. So a more reactive approach uh, to resisting these constructions. Arguably, communities in Limerick require greater support due to the quantity alone of media coverage about the estate that requires monitoring and response, um, as well as the goal of proactive agenda setting. But we would argue that such capacity building represents an investment in the future of such areas. Past research tells us that stigmatised neighbourhood identities, along with their negative impact on employment, on service delivery and on material conditions, um, they can persist even when those physical and social conditions which initially invoked them have actually been changed. So they can persist after the area itself has actually altered. 
As such, rehabilitating a spoiled identity is part of, we would argue, the process of regeneration. Reputation, however intangible, is very real in its consequences. Thank you.